Lord God, we come to you, um, and Lord, we thank you for IYC. We thank you for, Lord, the many years and many conventions and, and many lives that have been changed uh, through the, the past hundred years of, of international youth conventions. And Lord, we thank you for, for uh, again, the group that was able to go from our church, and Lord, for the impact that it had in their life and in their faith. And Lord, I pray that that impact would continue in each of them, uh, Lord, as they continue to just shine your light every day. Uh, and just to grow in their faith, just as, as we all do, uh, together as a church family, Lord, growing together and moving closer to you as we move in our journey. Lord, we do just want to lift up uh, just our, our country in this time, Lord, and just the chaos that's ensued even in just the last few days. And Lord, we pray for different families that have been affected, the lives that were lost. Uh, and Lord, we just lift them up to you. And Lord, we just pray for our leaders. We pray for our country. And Lord, we just ask uh, for your presence, Lord, to continue to be with us. Lord, this morning as we um, come to your word, Lord, we uh, just come with expectant hearts to hear from you. And Lord, we thank you for the, that we see your hand, Lord, that we feel your presence, that we know you are at work. And Lord, we, I thank you for those that are being baptized today and just that we can celebrate as a church family uh, this, this afternoon and evening. Uh, Lord, we just pray for your blessing upon that event. And Lord, we pray now that as we open your word this morning, as we continue our study of the life of Jesus, Lord, of the gospel message as John has, has written it down. And Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to what we need to hear this morning. Lord, we thank you that the pages of scripture are alive with your spirit. And Lord, as we open it today, as we continue our worship through your word, Lord, I just ask that, that you would open our eyes to what you need us to see this morning. Lord, may we hear your voice. Lord, may we be, be a church and be people, Lord, that don't just hear your word, but truly do what it says. We love you, praise you. God, receive our worship um, of our tithing, of our prayers, of our singing, of our studying of your word. And Lord, we just commit it all to you. Guide us now as we uh, open your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are continuing our message series that we're uh, going through this summer as we study through the Gospel of John. We are doing a chapter a week, and so uh, we are on chapter 7 today. So if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to, to open up and find uh, chapter 7. That's where we're going to be at. And, and just as we go through the summer, let's say you know where we're going. Uh, and just I encourage you to do your own reading, your own study in the gospel as we work through it. If you're here with us, again, you'll see, see that. If, if you're online, again, you can listen to it live. Um, if you're going to be gone, I just encourage you to, to continue to study on your own and just read that. You can, again, catch up with, uh, with our podcast or, or those as we run through this study. But I just want to start this morning again, with our theme verse is at the end of the gospel, as John kind of tells us, why he wrote his gospel and, and uh, what he's doing in that. Again, if you've been following along, you've, you should know this verse very well by now. Uh, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, it says, The disciples saw Jesus do many other miracle, miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you'll have life by the power of of his name. And we see, again, John tells us that there's way more that he could have put in than what he has put into the gospel. Right? More miracles, more teachings, but yet he strategically chose what he shares with us um, to, make, to, to, to build his case, right? to, to make it where beyond a shadow of a doubt that we know that Jesus is the Messiah, and that once we know that, that we will live out that belief. And again, as he says, live by the power of the name of Christ. And my hope and prayer for you and, and for me and for all of us as a church family is that we are living in the power of the name of Christ every single day, right? That we are seeing him work, that we are being, uh, again, responding to his direction and his leading. I mean, as John continues to build his case, right, to convince us, uh, his, us and all the audience of his gospel that Jesus is the Messiah and what it takes to be saved, now we find ourselves moving into um, a chapter 7 and chapter 8. And, and this is, a, is an interesting little section of the gospel. Okay, we saw, again, the intro in chapter 1. We saw in chapters 2, 3, and 4 where Jesus gathered his disciples and he kind of you know, pushed away the spotlight. And then we saw in chapter 5, we ended up into this, starting this new phase of Jesus' earthly ministry as he starts to, 
to attract crowds and kind of go, go big and go public. And, and, and again, that kind of culminated last week in chapter 6 when he feeds the 5,000, right? But then we also saw that, that there were many of the, that crowd that, that deserted Jesus at the end of chapter 6. And, and as we look at that, now we move on to chapter 7. And, and again, these, these next two chapters is a little bit of a break in the action. Especially as we look at John chapter 7, there is no miracle in John chapter 7. They, there is honestly even no, uh, no new content taught in chapter 7. Um, but there is a bunch of talking and dialogue between Jesus and several other people. This is kind of, kind of a, a mid-project checkup, if you will. As John is building his case and moving through this, we see that uh, here at chapter 7, we are a third of the way through the gospel. Okay, and in this, this chapter here, he is kind of evaluating how are we doing? Are, do we truly believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Are we living by the power of his Spirit? And, and as, we, as we look at that and as we approach chapter 7 this morning, I just wanted to present this question to you to keep in the forefront of your mind as we dive into the text. Okay, and that question is, what is your reaction to Jesus? Okay, what is your reaction to Jesus? Like I said, we've, we've already seen miracles. We've had um, victories. We've had struggles. We've had helpful teaching. We've had you know, hard teaching. I mean, there, there's been all these things that we've already learned here in the first six chapters. And now John kind of takes a, a pause in the action and presents us with this question. What's your reaction to Jesus? Right now, as we approach the text this morning into chapter seven, I'll tell you is that the verdict that comes out of the text is lots of mixed reviews. Hey, there's, there's, there's several different reactions to Jesus that comes out of, of the text this morning. Hey, that, um, it, it, as we look at this, kind of the, like I said, the theme of this chapter is mixed reviews. Hey, again, everyone didn't really know what to do with Jesus. I mean, yes, he does these miracles, but he also gives these hard teachings. They couldn't resolve what they, had saw, what they saw happening in front of them with what they knew about the Messiah, not just from the scriptures, but even from their own tradition and even these, these traditional rumors that are around about the Messiah. And, and they were seeing what Jesus was doing and what Jesus was teaching, and yet they had these other things in the back of their head. They're like, but he doesn't fit the mold. And, and they were not sure what to do with Jesus. Now, this chapter... And the entire chapter takes place during the Jewish festival of shelters. Now, this is a seven-day Jewish celebration where everybody would camp out in shelters uh, in commemoration of the exodus from Egypt. Hey, now this, um, again, this festival was first introduced in Leviticus chapter 23, Hey, and in fact, as we look through scriptures, especially through the Gospels, we see that the different Jewish festivals kind of mark the timeline for us in these three and a half years of Jesus' public ministry. Hey, and in, in, this, uh, in this text, again, it, it is uh, the, the, again, this celebration, right? This festival of shelters. And in this, the, the most Jews in the area, they would migrate towards Jerusalem, right? And then they would camp out in these shelters, and so that is kind of the, the, the context, the setting, um, uh, as we jump into John chapter 7. So again, if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to open with me to John chapter 7. We are going to start with the first nine verses. So John chapter 7, starting at verse 1. It says, After this, Jesus traveled around Galilee, and he wanted to stay out of Judea, where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. But soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters, and Jesus' brother said to him, Leave here and go, go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. Jesus replied, now is not the right time for me to go, but you can go any time. The world can't hate you, but it does hate me because I accuse it of doing evil. You go on. I'm not going to this festival because my time has not yet come. 
And after saying these things, Jesus remained in Galilee. So again, we're, we see John here set the stage of what's happening in this festival. Okay, and we see this first interaction between Jesus and his brothers in these opening verses. Again, we see there's this festival happening in Jerusalem, right? And, and his brothers kind of push Jesus. And we see that, that, again, their view of Jesus, even in that, is very mixed. Right? Because they're, they're calling him out. They're like, you're doing all these awesome miracles, but come on, man, claim the fame. Right? Embrace it. And yet we see that John has his own dialogue in there. He's like that his brothers didn't even really believe in him. In some ways, they were even mocking him in a little bit. And we see, again, they're the Jesus' brothers' view of Jesus. They are, are pushing him to claim the fame. They say, take advantage of, of this, this, this fame, this, this notoriety. Take advantage of it while you can. Right? Claim your five minutes of fame. Hey, now, as we see that, we kind of wonder and sit back and be like, what is really behind this? Again, this conversation reiterates that his brothers were still undecided on if Jesus really was the Messiah. Now, think about their perspective, though. Right? He was the annoying older brother who always did everything right. Right? And so again, you can think for them in this moment, they're like, well, now here he is doing these miracles, you know, attracting these crowds. I mean, at least we can get something out of it this time. Right? You be famous and we'll be the brothers of the famous guy. Right? And again, you, there's this, this kind of sarcastic tone underneath their comments. And we see again in verses 4 and 5 where their attitudes really come out. Is they, they tell him, you can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, then show yourself to the world. And they're like, come on, come on, Jesus. They claim it, right? Do this. Go to the festival. Everybody's going to be there. This is your chance to shine. And, and as they kind of push him in this way, we see you know, this, th their view, again, of, of Jesus is one that we still see in our culture today. And in fact, as we go through the text, we're going to see that, right? We see these different reactions to Jesus, and then we also see how it can be seen in our world today in 2024, because they are all still very present. Hey, and as we look at this view of Jesus, right, of just claim the fame, take advantage of it while you can, this is how we see it today in our culture. There are those that use Jesus and the church to make myself feel better. Again, their belief in Jesus is shallow, if even decided. As we see, even the brothers themselves say, like, they were undecided on whether Jesus truly was the Messiah. Hey, and yet we see people approach Jesus and the church just like this in our culture today, don't we? Right? They look at it, they're like, what's in it for me? Right? I, I can at least claim the, the community. I can claim the business context. I can you know, claim the emotional high. I can, I can claim the kind of whatever. I, I can take what I can take for myself from Jesus and yet still be undecided on whether I really want to commit my life to him. Are you really the Messiah or are we not? Again, they're just as undecided as Jesus' brothers. Again, it's not only just to make myself feel better, but also even to get handouts from people or from the church. I will tell you, we get called all the time, people asking for money. And, and to think, we, again, we see this like, Typically, somebody who's in this place is only around the church as long as it benefits themselves. And as soon as they're challenged or, or wanting to, to go to the next level, they just go to the next church. Or they just walk away completely. I'll tell you, there's, as I think about this attitude, I, I just did self self-confession. There are times that I've kind of had this attitude, right? When I, again, maybe you've gone to a work conference Right? And you go into the vendor area of, of the convention, right? and you walk through there, and we go there just to get all the free stuff, right? 
and you listen to all the sales pitches and, and all those things, knowing that you're not going to buy, but like, but what do they have to offer me at their booth, right? I get the free mints, I get the highlighters, I get the, you know, all the little swag stuff, right? And we go through and we just collect it all, right? Knowing that I just have to put up with the sales pitch, right? To get the free stuff. And again, the, the reality is there are people that approach Jesus in this same way. Hey, now, as, as we see this first attitude, this re- first reaction to Jesus, hey, the text continues into this whole next section, hey, it, which is verses 10 through 36. Hey, now, as we look at these verses, again, we don't have time to read the entire text this morning, but I'll tell you, spoiler alert, Jesus actually ends up going to the festival. He sends his brothers, and kind of everybody goes there at first, but he goes there kind of in secret. He shows up, and he's kind of in the background, and he sneaks in, doesn't draw attention to himself until he wants the attention. And Jesus does reveal himself at the festival. He draws attention to himself about halfway through the festival as he comes out and starts openly teaching in the temple. Okay, now as he does that, um, there are two kind of distinctly different groups of Jewish people that are present. Hey, now again, this is a Jewish festival, right? The, the, the city is, is just busting at the seams. There are people everywhere, right, in the temple area. And, and there, are, there are two different groups of Jews and how they react to Jesus. There are the Jews that have not made up their mind about Jesus. Right? They're, they're wondering, kind of like his brothers, is he the Messiah? Is he not? We really don't know. And then there's another group of Jews that have already decided who they believe Jesus is. Hey, now as we look at, at this this interaction and the teaching and all of these things, the, the, the first view of Jesus that we come across is just the general crowd. And this is generally the Jews that have not made up their mind yet about who Jesus is. Hey, and, and from there, again, I just want to summarize kind of their perspective that we can draw from the text, is, is that they, like I said, they're very undecided, hey, and they, they see that he could be a crazy man trying to deceive everyone. Or he could be everything he claims to be. And they're not really sure. Yeah, in fact, we see um, some of their interaction where we see this attitude come out. And, and in fact, I do want to read a portion of this text. We're going to pick up at verse 16. So John 7, we're going to pick up at verse 16. So Jesus told them, My message is not my own. It comes from God who sent me. Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or is merely my own. Those who speak for themselves want glory only for themselves, but a person who seeks to honor the one who sent him speaks truth, not lies. Moses gave you the law, but none of you obeys it. In fact, you are trying to kill me. And the crowd replied, you're demon-possessed. Who's trying to kill you? And Jesus replied, I did one miracle on the Sabbath, and you were amazed. But you work on the Sabbath too, when you obey Moses' law of circumcision. Actually, this tradition of circumcision began with the patriarchs long before the law of Moses. For if the correct time of circumcising your son falls on the Sabbath, you go ahead and do it as to not break the law of Moses. So why should you be angry with me for healing a man on the Sabbath? Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. Hey, now again, as they're undecided in this moment, and they're kind of taking this, we see kind of their reaction come out, right? They, they say, Jesus, you're crazy. You might even be demon-possessed, right? You're saying all these kind of weird things. Now, again, their accusation of him in this is saying, again, you are here to deceive us, right? To, to lead us down a road that is, it is not true. Now, notice, though, that Jesus, in these verses we just read, he establishes the, where his authority comes from to teach and make the claims that he's, that he's making. What does he say? He says, I have been sent by the Father himself. Again, it's not coming um, from an established Jewish teacher like their tradition demands. Right? In fact, he denounces their authority by calling them out on their double standard. 
of look at you, like you, you're down on me for this miracle for healing this man that we saw in the previous chapter, right, at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath day. And he's like, but yet you guys do the same thing that you're commanding, you're, you know, um, condemning me for doing. And then notice, though, Jesus makes this very, very strong statement in verse 24. Right? At the end of this kind of rea- interaction with them, as he, he kind of pushes back and, and, and challenges their authority, claims authority of himself, then in verse 24, he tells them, look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. Again, Jesus realizes that they're conflicted, they're undecided. Right? They're not sure. Do we go with the easy answer or do we follow you know, the authority of the Lord and the Messiah and, and what Jesus is doing? And, and Jesus challenges them right back as they challenge him with this claim that he's being demon-possessed. Right? And, and he challenges them, again, with this statement to make a decision on who you're really going to follow. But notice he tells them, though, he's like, But don't just take somebody's word for it, right? Don't just follow the crowd. He's like, look beneath the surface yourself. Seek the Lord. Evaluate the scriptures, right? Look beneath the surface so that you can judge correctly. And I'll tell you is this command of Jesus is still applies to us today. Hey, dig deep. Dig into scripture. Dig into tradition. Pray. Seek the Lord. Right? Like, like do what the Lord asks you to do. Don't take my word for it. Don't take any other pastor's word for it. Read it yourself. Dig deep. Ask your questions. Hey, come and find help. Right? Work through it. Jesus challenges them and us to not just blindly follow anything that you hear, but dig beneath the surface. Now, this is true when it comes to to God and to the scriptures. This is true in everything in life. Don't just blindly follow what you hear. This is true not just with your spirituality, but this is also true with news headlines, political candidates, community issues, Bible teaching, All of it, dig deeper, ask your questions. And I will tell you, if there's any teacher that is afraid of your questions or tells you you can't dig deeper yourself, run from that teaching. Because the truth has nothing to hide. The truth is not afraid of your questions. Jesus was not afraid of their questions. In fact, he encouraged them to dig deeper. Right, look at the bigger picture. Right, again, how do we see this kind of play out today in our culture? Right, we, we see that hearing about salvation through grace and the teachings of Jesus seems strange and foreign because it's just not the way our world works. And yet, Jesus might be real, but he also could just be another cultural myth. Again, and Jesus invites us to dig deeper. But again, we, our world is full of cultural myths. In fact, there was a very successful TV program that was built on this premise right, of cultural myths. It's kind of an old TV show now. If, you might have seen it, but it's called Mythbusters. Okay, and, and again, if you haven't watched it, like I said, you can, yeah, you can stream it somewhere, I'm sure. But there are 14 full seasons addressing cultural myths. And testing them, like, could these really be real? They're things that we all believe in, but we aren't sure if they're really true. Right, and the premise of the show is they test it. They, like, scientifically test these theories, right, and these myths. And then they they come back with their conclusion of either the myth is confirmed, it's plausible, or it's busted. And I would encourage you to look at most things in life with this same attitude. Do what Jesus tells them to do and tells us to do. Dig deeper. Do the research. Ask the questions, right? And so that you can judge correctly. Again, when you look at there, it's, again, if, especially if you are undecided about Jesus, but you're willing to listen and dig deeper, 
Please do that. Hey, the, the next view that we see of Jesus that comes out in this text is the other Jewish leaders and their view of Jesus. These are ones that have already decided that Jesus is a crazy man and he needs to be killed. Okay, now again, we already saw this earlier in the text a couple chapters ago, right, that they concluded that Jesus needs to be killed, right? And they started pl- plotting this uh, even at the beginning of the gospel. Okay, now we see that again, their uh, view of Jesus is that he's a troublemaker, he stirs up drama, and he disrupts their comfort by challenging their authority. Okay, and, and we see, again, this continue to play out not just here, but throughout the rest of the gospel, Again, they were connecting, believing, and following Jesus with breaking the law of Moses. And Jesus was establishing that that he was the fulfillment of the law of Moses as the Messiah. Again, we, we see kind of happening throughout all of the text, and it starts to play out that Jesus was not what they expected in the Messiah. He did not fit the mold. And then we see in verse 30 that we had just read that Jesus tells them that my time has not yet come. And this is a theme that, that runs, that John carries through the rest of the gospel until his, fine, his time does come, which is where he willingly submits himself to the guards and is arrested, which leads him to the cross. Again, we, we see in verse 32, again, these religious leaders It says that when these Pharisees heard that the crowds were whispering such things, they and the leading priests sent temple guards to arrest Jesus. They're like, this has gone far enough, right? And they send um, their guards to go arrest him. They're like, we are going to take care of this right now because they are already decided that Jesus has to be handled and taken care of. Hey, again, how do we see this play out today? Right, we see people that already have their mind made up about Jesus. That no amount of teaching, no amount of experience, or, or even work of the Holy Spirit is going to change their mind. They, they kind of realize that if he is real, the belief in him will only mess up their life, that they currently have something that they really don't want. Right, and again, we see this in our culture and our world today a lot, don't we? Those that... that might even admit, yeah, Jesus could be real. But I like my life the way it is. And I don't want to have to change anything. So I'll just leave him at arm's length or just reject him completely. But their mind is already made up. Again, even if their life is miserable... It seems better to them to remain in their misery than to submit to Jesus because it might be bad, but at least it's familiar. Right? And I don't have to step out in faith. Now, as we look at, at this text and we look at all of, again, these interactions and these different views of Jesus, they, we end up in really the climax of the chapter in verses 37 through 39. And here, this is where we learn, again, that these three views of Jesus, these ones that we've seen from his brothers, from from the undecided Jews at the festival, from the already decided Jews at the festival, we see these three different views of Jesus, and we learn that these three views of Jesus are not permanent. Okay, that God knows that they're not permanent, right? That the mission of the Messiah is to save not just those that believe in him, but even those that have all of these views that we've already seen. That these views of Jesus are not permanent. In, in verses 37 through 39, we have on the last day, at the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And when he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. Again, there's even in this declaration that Jesus makes here in these verses, right? He is, again, once again, it's an invitation for anybody and everybody to come to 
Jesus and surrender their life and their heart. And once again, there's no new content. This is the third chapter in the gospel, already just seven chapters in, where John mentions living water. They, and, and as we see again, we are invited to drink of this living water. And then after Jesus makes this declaration, he invites everybody, right, no matter where they're at, to come to him, to, to, to drink of this living water, of the life that comes through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then we see, again, the conclusion of the chapter in verses 40 through 52. And I do want to read these verses. John chapter 7, picking up at verse 40, when it says, When the crowds heard him say this, some of them declared, Surely this man is the prophet we've been expecting. Others said, He is the Messiah. And still others said, But he can't be. Will the Messiah from, come from Galilee? For the scriptures clearly state that the Messiah will be born of a royal line of David in Bethlehem, the village where King David was born. So the crowd was divided about him. Some even wanted him arrested, but no one laid a hand on him. When the temple guards returned without having arrested Jesus, the leading priests and the Pharisees demanded, why didn't you bring him in? We've never heard anyone speak like this, the guards responded. Have you been led astray too, the Pharisees mocked? Is there a single one of us rulers or Pharisees who believes in him? This foolish crowd follows him, but they are ignorant of the law. God's curse is on them. And then Nicodemus, the leader who had met with Jesus earlier, spoke up. Is it legal to, convince, uh, or to convict a man before he is given a hearing, he asked. And they replied, are you from Galilee too? Search the scriptures and see for yourself. No prophet ever comes from Galilee. Now, as we read these verses, first off, we see whether it's these Pharisees and religious leaders or even those in the crowd, if they would have just do what Jesus told them to do earlier in the chapter is dig deeper and choose for yourself, they would learn that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, right? They would find real answers, but, but yet they're still coming to this, right, with these un, um, undecided conclusions, and yet what we learn from these verses, from kind of the, the culmination of this interaction at this festival, is that many were drawn to Jesus by something that they couldn't explain. Many were drawn to Jesus by something they couldn't explain. Again, the crowd was drawn to him, right? We see that's kind of where we start. It says many of them believe he really is the Messiah. We can't explain it, but we also don't think we, should, we have to. Just look at him, right? Just listen to him. Hey, we also, we see the guards, right, that were sent there to literally arrest Jesus. They came back days later, right, without him, right? And, and again, the reaction, we, we see how, how they, they were drawn to him, right? Many of the crowds believed. These, these, again, these guards, right, after literally gone a few days of hearing Jesus and interacting with him, did not arrest him. And we see their testimony, verse 46, we've never heard anyone speak like this. They were drawn to Jesus in a way that they could not explain. And then we see even at the end, right, as the, the religious leaders speak out, and they're like, even none of us believe in him, and yet Nicodemus speaks up. And we get this glimpse of Nicodemus that we are first introduced to in chapter 3. Right, and here Nicodemus, in the midst of this crowd of Pharisees, defends Jesus. And we get a glimpse that he is even drawn to Jesus by something he even himself cannot explain. Again, how do we see this play out today? We see it just like these other views of Jesus. We see this play out today, that God pursues everyone with his love and draws us to him. And when God is, is chasing after you and you start to feel his love and his presence and so your eyes start to open up to the fact that he's really there and that he really does love you and there's things going on in your life and conversations and, and interactions and, and, and blessings and things that you just can't explain, right, is when you feel for the very first time that God does love me. Even when I push him away, he still pursues me. Even when I have questions that I just can't, find answers to. He still loves me. Even when I spit in his face and tell him to leave, he still loves me. 
God is still pursuing us today with his love and drawing you to him. Regardless of your reaction to him, he loves us first. And we see again these so many interactions and these reactions are common in our world today and yet this is still just as common. No matter where you are at in your life or your faith journey right now, even if you've pushed God away over and over and over again, God is still pursuing you because he loves you. And so many times, again, as we, as we are drawn to him, right, he's inviting us to take the next step in your journey, whatever that step is. Again, we see the guards take a step in their journey towards Jesus. They didn't necessarily receive him as their savior, but they take a step towards him. Right? We see Nicodemus take a step towards him. We see many in the crowd take a step forward in their journey. And I want to ask you this morning, what's your next step in your journey? And I want to end with the same question we started with. What is your reaction to Jesus? We see all kinds of reactions in this text. And yet we see the core truth that God loves you. He wants to save you. He wants to transform your heart and your mind. And these three distinct common reactions to Jesus in this chapter, we also see that people can be open to Jesus and take steps in their journey towards him. Today, many times in life, especially many times in our faith, our journey feels like this. Right? And there were many times, again, in that text, right, that it felt like this. And again, you might be sitting here even today and being like, this is what my faith feels like. That I will tell you, as you look at this picture, and you can identify with it, I'm sure. But no matter where you're headed, you don't have to leave it up to chance. It's not just a matter of luck. Because if we put this in a spiritual context, it doesn't say good luck. It says, I love you. And again, what is your reaction to Jesus this morning? Which leads me to my final thought, and that's this. It doesn't matter where your journey starts. It does matter where your journey's taking you. Is your journey taking you to Christ? I hope it is. Will you take the next step? Will you move closer to Christ today? And again, maybe it's just moving closer or just even being open to dig deeper and to learn about him. Right? Maybe your next step this morning is asking, asking him into your life and receiving him for your saviors the first time. Maybe you've already done that. Maybe the next step is just saying, Lord, I, I believe in you, but I've been pushing you away and, and I'm not gonna do that anymore. Right? Maybe it's just committing, again, just like those, those this afternoon, committing to, to being baptized or to getting into a small group or just to praying more often, to reading my Bible every day. I don't know what the next step of your journey is, but I hope that you will take, take it and move closer to Jesus today. He loves you. He's inviting you to move closer to him. And what is your reaction to that invitation this morning? Lord God, that's our prayer this morning. Lord, that we can give ourselves to you. Lord, that we can receive you in our life. Lord, that we can walk with you. That we can receive your love and grace to be transformed by your spirit every day. And Lord, even if that's not our response today this morning, Lord, we thank you for loving us. And God, I pray for those, Lord, that might be undecided. Lord, that don't know you as your savior. Lord, help them to feel your love today. Lord, I pray for those that do know you, that just need to just a jump forward in their faith. Lord, refresh them today. And Lord, I pray for those that are walking with you every day. God, that they will continue to not just grow in you, but to share you with the world that so desperately needs you. And Lord, we thank you for loving us, no matter our, our response to you. No matter what our reaction is, God, you don't stop loving us. And we, we praise you for that today. And God, as we go this week, I pray, God, that you would move us forward in our faith. God, that you would use us to shine your light, to share your love with this world. God, that we would be your church every single day. Lord, guide us as we go. We give ourselves to you. Lord, use us this week. 
In Jesus' precious holy name we pray.